today as we come to the table. You know, I wonder when God sees some of these TV preachers that are taking advantage of people. I know there are some good TV preachers. I know that. And there's some good radio teachers as well and preachers. I understand that, but there's a lot of them that aren't good. And you need to use wisdom and discernment. And whenever you see them begging for money, or when you see them especially, and I've heard these stories where they actually ask people, look, if you don't have the money, then God wants you to do this. God wants you to go take out a loan and send it to our ministry. Woe to that person. Woe to them. They're going to stand before a righteous God one day, and He's going to clean house, and they're not going to be happy. Have you heard people say they don't like going to church because the only thing the church wants is their money? Well, it's true and sad that some churches are taking advantage of people. Sadly, that result is creating anger in the hearts of people who really want to follow God. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. The religious leaders in Jesus' time were making the people do certain things in order to worship God. Rituals and specifications on sacrificial articles were causing people to spend time and money that they couldn't afford. They were simply being taken advantage of. Today, Pastor Mark will share Jesus' response to this ungodly activity. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John, chapter 2, as he continues his message entitled, Jerusalem, Jesus, and the Temple of Doom. Imagine the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount area today, if you draw a big square on the whole area, there's a flat area up there, I think, that covers somewhere around 40 acres, but it's probably somewhere around between 17 and 19 acres where the actual temple area was. And imagine in that area of 17 to 19, maybe 20 acres, Josephus said there would be as many as 100,000 people on that temple mount at every moment throughout the Passover, every day, because of people coming and going and all the sacrifices and all the animals and all the millions that surrounded them. 100,000 people. Now, how many is that? Imagine emptying out Nayland Stadium and putting them all there. Now, all of a sudden, you hear this whip begin to crack echoing off the, 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 the concrete walls and the colonnade in Solomon's porch where they would set all these different stands up and they had these animals and all these things they were doing. And you hear this whip and people begin to run and the animals begin to clear out and the Lord begins throwing tables over and just smashing everything. Get out of here. What are you doing? You've made my father's house a den of thieves. It's like the worst of the worst. And so this scene here is very dramatic uh, when you see the Lord doing this, driving out tens of thousands of people with nothing but a whip and his voice. What authority he must have commanded. What did his face look like? Why was it when they sent the temple police to arrest him that the police went back to the police chief and said, we didn't get him. Where is he? Well, you should have heard how he talked. Can you imagine today if the police sent someone out to arrest someone, you know, and and they start to arrest them and all of a sudden they begin to talk to them and the police just kind of freeze and look at them and don't know what to do. And they go back and say, so where is he? Well, chief, we we tried to get him. Well, what'd you do? Use a taser? Did you get handcuffs? Did he fight you? No, he just spoke and we couldn't do anything. So we came back. Who is this guy? What power does he have? What authority does he walk in? Listen, when you have that kind of authority, it's something that's given and other people know it and they feel it. Authority is not something you have to fight for. Authority is something given. And when authority is given, you know that it's given. And Jesus walked in God-given authority. He was God himself and the power he commanded when he did this. And again, I think of just, you know, people that try to paint Jesus as this kind of emaciated, weak character. A lot of times you see this in art or in drawings or in whatever the case might be. And again, always smiling, you know, because well, listen, he was a man's man. 
This was someone that took command of that situation and drove out tens of thousands of people with a whip just saying, get out of here, turning tables over, smashing things. He had attention. If this was just a normal, normal person, the temple police would have just arrested him, had him in cuffs, so to speak, and hauled him off. But nobody touched him. Why? The authority, the power, the commanding presence of our Lord. He was strong. And I love this side of Jesus because, again, he was a man's man. And now, here's something else I want you to understand about God's anger. It's not something that just is sudden and just explodes. Jesus didn't just walk on the Temple Mount and lose it. He was always under control. It was a controlled anger. And how do we know that? Notice it says, when he made a whip of cords. Guys, how long did it take to make a whip of cords? 30 minutes? 40? I don't know. He had to find the straps. He had to begin to interweave them the way that a whip is. He had to tie off the ends, secure it, get it ready, and then step into action. This was not some explosive moment where the Lord just lost it because he didn't know what was going on. This was a thought-out, controlled anger, and it was a righteous anger for his father's sake. Who are you? What are you doing in my father's house? Why are you causing the believers to stumble by making religion something they hate because you're making it ugly? Who do you think you are? Get out of here. Don't you love him? How can you not love him? I mean, he just, this is the kind of person I want to follow. This is the Jesus that I want to follow. And I say that because this is the Jesus of the Bible. There are a lot of Jesuses out there. Everybody, if you talk to them, guys, everybody has a Jesus. And they'll tell you what they think Jesus was like. Well, don't take this wrong, but Jesus doesn't care what they think he's like. He only cares about who he is. And our job is to find out who the real Jesus is and what the Bible says about him. It says in John that those who believe in Jesus, note this, as the scripture has said... Out of their hearts will flow rivers of living water. Not the Jesus as the culture has said, or as they believe, as this guideline tells us, this is who I am. And so this is the Lord that I love, and this is a controlled, righteous anger at evil. And again, the kind of way that we need to be if we're going to have righteous anger for the things of God, not for personal benefit, but for the Father's benefit. And I know I mentioned this earlier, but when was the last time you got mad for God's sake? When's the last time that happened? You know when I usually get mad? Almost always. Nine out of ten times, and I may be exaggerating, I'm mad for my sake. Why was this? Why did this happen? Who is that? What? Now my tire's flat. They did this. That happened. Why is this? And how come? But it's all for me. I'm mad for me. That's sinful anger. When's the last time we really got mad and said, listen, this is about Jesus. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are just to say that you think that something the Bible says is wrong? You're going to now say culturally that it's okay. It's an abomination to God. Who made you God? How can you suddenly change God's standards? Who are you? See, that's a righteous anger. That's a turning the tables over in the temple anger. And that's the kind of anger if we're going to have, God wants us to have. The Lord turns them over. And as he turns them over and runs everyone out, cracking this whip, you know, it says this, says, and he said to those, verse 16, who sold the doves. Now note that, that's key. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. It's a den of thieves, he mentions in another passage. In this particular one, he calls it a place of merchandise. So he said both. You've made my house a den of thieves. Now he gets, another gospel tells us, now he gets over here to these guys selling the doves. And he says, you've made my father's house a place of merchandise. Why the place of the doves? Why the doves specifically did he stop and, and actually speak to them directly? Because guys, this was the most egregious. Why? The dove was what was sold to the poor person who didn't have the money to buy the normal sacrifice. You were to bring a lamb. If you couldn't afford a lamb, you would buy an inexpensive dove. And the point was, they not only were taking advantage of those who had some money, they were taking advantage of those who didn't have any money. And if they wanted to worship the Lord, they had to be taken advantage of by buying these doves at these exorbitant prices, probably saving up most everything they had just to live on after traveling that long distance to be able to carry out the sacrifices on the Temple Mount. Now you know why the Lord was so mad. And now you know why I love him so much and I know why you love him so much because he takes up for those who can't take care for themselves, the poor and the weak. And the Lord stopped specifically and said, what do you think you're doing? I love it. Then he said to his disciples, verse 17, uh, rather, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Again, the scripture, a messianic psalm, says that zeal for the Lord's house, or rather not a psalm, but a messianic scripture says that zeal for the Lord's house had eaten him up. 
And now they're seeing this fulfilled in front of their very eyes when they remembered this psalm that spoke about him, that it was eaten up, there, that he was eaten up. They're seeing it fulfilled. And again, God still hates this today. You know, I wonder when God sees some of these TV preachers that are taking advantage of people. I know there are some good TV preachers. I know that. And there's some good radio teachers as well and preachers. I understand that. But there's a lot of them that aren't good. And you need to use wisdom and discernment. And whenever you see them begging for money, or when you see them especially, and I've heard these stories where they actually ask people, look, if you don't have the money, then God wants you to do this. God wants you to go take out a loan and send it to our ministry. Woe to that person. Woe to them. They're going to stand before a righteous God one day, and he's going to clean house. And they're not going to be happy because they're taking advantage of God's people, God's little sheepies, (laughs) especially the ones that don't have any money. Those pastors should be sending money to those poor people, not taking it from them. Because they've got enough to live on, quite certain, quite obviously. But the bottom line is, is that you see why the Lord hates this. And so he deals with it in a very firm way. You know, it's interesting. One of the things you would do at the Passover, one of the requirements of the Passover is you had to clear your house out of all leaven. Everything leaven had to be gone. So you removed all the leaven from your house and they would clear everything out. Why? Because leaven in scripture was a picture of evil, of sin. So you were to clear everything out of your house to show, literally, to show symbolically you were, tr- you were also clearing everything out of your heart so you'd be clean before God. I, Tracy talks about this. There was this Jewish lady in Santa Fe that hired Tracy to come clean her house of all the leaven when it came to Passover. So she'd go in there for the feast. She had to remove everything, you know, move the couches, move all the stuff, get all the leaven out of the house so she wouldn't have any leaven in her house. And so there was a literal thing about this. This is Jesus now clearing his father's house of all the leaven. They didn't clear it themselves. They were supposed to, but they didn't. So Jesus went in and started turning tables over. He said, you didn't get the leaven out of this house? He said, now you get out of this house. And if we don't get the leaven out of our house, out of the heart of our home, then we don't have a place with the Lord in the kingdom. We've got to deal with it. And so there's a lot of representation and symbolic things going on here as the Lord did this. And the Lord was basically doing what the religious leaders had refused to do. He's cleaning house. I love it. So notice this, the Jews answered him there in verse 18 and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Now again, notice they didn't say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Stop what you're doing, it's wrong. They didn't say that because they knew it was wrong. They knew in their heart what they were doing was wrong. But they wanted a sign. Who gives you the authority? How can you come in here and just kick people out like you own the place? Like, you know, like this is yours or whatever, you know. (laughs) Interestingly enough, as we know, it was. He created it all. It was his father's. It was his. Again, can you imagine coming home to your house and finding a bunch of people after vacation in your house, you know, and they're in there and they have stuff set up everywhere and there's stuff, there's porno over here and there's like, you know, booze over here and there's all kinds of things going. And you come in your house, what are you doing? Who are you people? Get out of my home, right? Again, this is exactly how Jesus felt when he walked on the temple. He said, this is my home. This is to be holy for my God. This is where God's spirit is going to move among the nations. And look what you've done to it. So what sign will you show us? Again, asking for a sign, and Jesus is going to give him the best sign, his death and resurrection, showing that he's God. Listen to what he says. And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and I believe he said it that way, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Again, what was he talking about? He was talking about his body, the temple of his body. Look what it says in 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, they couldn't hear this because they were thinking fleshly. They're thinking physical. They're thinking whatever. And Jesus often used physical pictures to, to bring a spiritual truth to bear, but they couldn't see what he was saying. And that's why I think he emphasized, you destroy this body and I'll raise it up in three days. I'll show you that I have the right to do this. I am God Almighty. And I'm one with the Father who is my Father, and you're defiling his house. And I'm going to show it by my death and by my resurrection. And by the way, there's no greater sign that Jesus was who he said he was than by his death and resurrection. You know, people oftentimes want to see a miracle, prove that you're this or whatever. They always tempted Jesus with that. What greater proof could you have than someone die and raise from the dead? And Jesus did that. And over 500 people saw him after he raised from the dead, the Scripture says. And they were still alive when Paul wrote that. Which means if it wasn't true, they could have come forward and said, where are those 500? They didn't see him. No, they said, yeah, we did see him. He rose from the dead. He's alive. And we saw him. And so he says, that's going to be the sign you're going to get. And notice this, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy the temple. This In three days, I'll raise it up. Verse 20, then the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you'll raise it up in three days? Again, remember, Herod was doing a major upgrade on the temple. 
And they've been working on the temple now for 46 years. The basic structure of the temple was in place, but they were building it up and making it this amazing world, you know, a draw, if you will, this, this world of wonder as Herod was working on it. He says, we've been doing this 46 years. You say tear it down, you'll raise it up in three days. But again, because they didn't understand what he was saying because they weren't thinking spiritually and they couldn't understand him. So they didn't know what to say here as far as they didn't, or didn't, know how to grasp what he was saying. But notice it says he was speaking of the temple of his body there in verse 21. And therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, this is interesting that they remembered after he resurrected from the dead and then they believed. Remember, the disciples didn't even believe in the resurrection until after Jesus resurrected. He told them numerous times over and over, I'm going to die and then I'm going to resurrect. And they still didn't believe it until he resurrected. He had died and resurrected and they're hiding in the upper room still weeping because he's gone and afraid of the Jewish, you know, uh, religious leaders. And the Lord has to show up and say, hey, it's me. I told you I rose from the dead even as I said. Now, why do I, I bring that up? Because I think for a lot of us it takes multiple times to hear what Jesus has done in dying and resurrecting for us for us to believe Maybe you've heard it over and over and over, but you've never responded to it. That works perfectly into the next few verses because notice what happens. In verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, note this, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So you have a lot of believers here because they saw the signs that he did during the time of the Passover. But look at verse 24. This is key. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. This is amazing to me. There are several things to note here. First of all, notice it says that many believed in his name due to the signs that he did. But notice it says he didn't commit himself to them because he knew men and he knew what was in all men. That is, in essence, they believed in Jesus, but they didn't believe sincerely. They were unsaved believers. Note that as it bounces around in your head like Pong. Those of you that are my age, you know what that is. Imagine a video game where something's bouncing around your head. They were unsaved believers. Mark, how can someone be an unsaved believer? There are lots of them today, and there may be some in here this morning. I was one for 25 years. What do you mean? I believed in Jesus. I believed he rose from the dead. I believed his blood took our sins away. I believed in Jesus. I was unsaved. Why? Because I didn't also receive him. Say, so Mark, you can't really believe and not be saved. Ask the fallen angels. They were in heaven with him, already in eternity, in heaven. They were there. He created them. The first thing they knew was, there stands our Lord. Then they rebelled with Lucifer. A third of them were cast out. They became what, what we know today of as the demons. And the Bible says, the demons believe. You better believe they believe. They've seen heaven. They've seen Jesus. But here's the question. Are these believing demons going to be in heaven with us? No, they're not. Is every believer in Jesus going to be in heaven? The answer to that is no. There are lots of unsaved believers. Then Mark, what do I need to do? It tells us in John chapter 1, it says, those who believed and received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. We don't even have the right to be his child until we believe and receive. There are two steps in salvation. Jesus did it all on the cross, but believing is not enough. You have to receive. We believe with the head. We receive with the heart. Lord, I receive you as my Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I give my life to you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I don't want to just believe. I want to receive so I know that I'm saved. And the question for us is, is are we unsaved Believers, Is there anyone here today that is, would say, I'm an unsaved believer? Maybe you say, well, I believe my whole life. I grew up believing. It always scares me when someone says, well, I've always known the Lord. That scares me. I'm not saying you didn't really meet him when you were a child. Maybe you really did. But if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt if, that you've truly met the Lord, you need to make sure you really do that for real today or at some point. Because when you grow up and you go to the church things and you have your baptism and you go through your confirmation class like I did and they say all the things over you, you know, you dominum, something or whatever, and then you leave, if it didn't happen in your heart, it means nothing. You will die in your sins. 
and you will die an unsaved believer. How tragic, how tragic to die as an unsaved believer like the demonic realm. You ever people say, well, I don't know that I believe in Jesus. I'll say, well, he doesn't believe in you either. But you can change all that by confessing your sins and believing that he died for you on a cross and that he rose again three days later. His word says it. He said it. Over 500 witnesses saw him after he resurrected from the dead. And right now, as I'm talking to you, you know that the Holy Spirit's convicting you that what I'm saying is true. See, here's what's cool about the Holy Spirit. As I share the word of God, you can fight it mentally. I don't believe this. I don't think. But in your heart, the Holy Spirit's going, it's true. Be quiet. It's true. Because you can't fight him. He's telling you that it's true because he loves you. And he'll allow you to rebel. He'll allow you to get mad. He'll allow you to make up your mind. But I refuse to believe it. Guys, how long do we have? I don't know. The Bible says that when unbelievers die, the unsaved believers or others that are unsaved, when they die, they go to a place called Hades. And they're held there until judgment day. And then after Judgment Day, then they're thrown into the lake of fire. But Hades is also a horrible place. It tells us in Luke 16, it's a place of great heat. It's a place of misery. It's a place of remembering what we did on the earth. It's a place of remembering that we rejected Christ. How long has God given you? I don't know. And this is not a scare tactic. You know, you're going to walk out of here and you're going to have a car crash. Look, I don't, I'm, this is not for that. This is to say, before you leave this body, make sure you know where the Spirit's going. Because eternity is forever. Eternity is a long, long time. It never stops. You know what? As I get older, things are breaking. You ever notice that? You probably, you know, you, things are breaking. Yes, I've noticed things on you are breaking more. No, I mean, things on you are breaking. On all of us, they're breaking. You know, some new thing gets torn or surgery is needed or whatever happens. Or you got to change your prescription or whatever. Your eyes, you know, don't see as good or whatever. But I have hope. It doesn't matter how many muscles I tear and how many knees go out and how often I change my glasses or how often I change my teeth in the future. I get a brand new model very soon. And it will never fade away. It will never die. It will never be tired. It will always be awesome because God made it to be awesome for eternity even as your new body and model will be. And we'll be with God forever in these new models. No matter what happens to us, guys, no matter how bad your situation physically or financially or in any other way, you have hope. You have hope because of Jesus. It's gonna be fantastic. This is the worst you're ever gonna have it down here on this earth. Now it may get worse in these bodies and I'm not saying that. This is the worst though. On this earth is the worst you're ever gonna have it. But if you don't know the Lord, this is the best it'll ever be. You're at the peak. This is heaven. What's it like? Are you enjoying it? Because this is the peak. And then when you die, you're moved from here to a place called Hades where there's a holding tank that's very hot and miserable. And you know when you sit there, guess what you don't have? Hope. There's no hope. The Bible says once you leave this body and go there, there's not another chance. There's no, there's no arguing. You can't bring your lawyer up. There can't, there's, no, there's nothing you can do. You're there and then you get transferred to judgment and you're eternally separated from God. Why do I say this so seriously? Because this is serious. And God wants our temples clean. He wants this temple clean. He wants to make sure that we're right with God. So if you've not done that, again, I make an appeal to you. Don't put it off. Don't wait till the last moment. Don't see how many years God can give you in the last minute you're gonna have the Hollywood finish. You know, my family's here and other one's here and I'm like 140 and Jesus received me. <sighs> right, you know? Most of the time it's just, Boom, where'd they go? They're, they're just gone. They were here one minute. We don't know when we're going, guys. We better be ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Thanks for spending the last half hour with us at the table of God's Word. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of John next time, but you don't have to wait for our next episode to keep digging into the Bible. You can access more messages right now at pastormarkkirk.com or subscribe to the daily podcast right from our website. And feel free to share these teachings with your friends or family members or someone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. The book of John is a great introduction to who Jesus is, and it might just be the conversation starter you've been looking for. That website again is pastormarkkirk.com. Hey, are you listening right now in the Knoxville area? If so, we want to meet you. 
Here's Pastor Mark with a personal invitation. Thanks, Greg. I want to let you know there's a seat waiting for you here at Calvary Knoxville. We've been here since 1997, and it's been an honor to see God do such incredible things in our fellowship and in this community. Come join us as we invest in God's Word and in each other. And yes, we're meeting in person. All our services and ministries are being held each week, but we're also streaming online for those who can't make it in person. You can find out everything by clicking on the Our Church section at PastorMarkKirk.com. I'm excited to see you this weekend, and I hope you'll join me again the next time we come to the table. to the table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville